so um, I'm going to try to keep this talk reasonably brief, which anybody who's heard me talk before will know is a big ask for me. Once I get going, I get going. Uh, but I'm going to try and leave a little bit of space for questions because my, my feeling is that this is the kind of um, talk that possibly lends itself to questions. So that's fine. Um, so first of all, why me? Why am I talking about this? Um, well, some of what Julie's already said possibly goes some way towards explaining this. Um, I, I seem to have death coming at me from all sides. Um, and I, I suspect this is not entirely coincidental, in fact. Um, yes, buy me a drink sometime back in the real world and um, <laughs> we'll go down that particular rabbit hole. Um, I'm, as Julie said, I'm a funeral director. My partner Keith and I own a funeral home that tries to do things a little bit differently to what is maybe the norm. Um, and I think one of the things that makes us different, there are many things that make us different, most of which have to do with transparency. Um, but one of the things that makes me different, possibly even amongst progressive funeral directors, is that I see my calling, and I do see it as a calling, to the bereaved, yes, but also to the dead. And that is something that is perhaps a little bit out of the ordinary, although not so much for a lot of you, I suspect, in a pagan context. Um, I'm also an academic researcher. I'm a PhD student um, researching contemporary druidry and death uh, in the, the broadest sense. And um, in that, I have a, a particular emphasis on um, new long and round barrows that are being built at the moment that echo Neolithic and Bronze Age barrows. And they are, um, they are designed to take cremated remains. And because of, I suppose, the connection with an imagined past, they are something that takes up probably about a third of what I have to say in my PhD. And I'll come back to those a little bit later on. Um, personally, my personal relationship with death is I think I'm a, compli a complicated one. I'm very lucky in a lot of ways. I haven't lost a lot of people. Um, I don't think you get to my age without losing anybody. Um, but compared to some people I have been I think very lucky. Both of my parents are still living. Um, but I have, I had I think when I was 16, I had what could best be described as a nervous breakdown and it was a humdinger and it was broadly because the absolute cold hard realization had hit me that i was going to die and that there was absolutely nothing i could do about it and i had been staving it off to an extent that uh, thus far because i went to an extremely evangelical christian school uh, and I tried very, very hard to be an extremely good evangelical Christian. You would be amazed how hard I tried to do that. And um, I had managed to stave it off to some extent with the possibility, just the outside possibility, that the second coming would happen before I died and therefore I wouldn't need to die. And when I was about 16, the enormity of how stupid an idea this was hit me. And the fact that there were no loopholes, there were no exceptions, I was going to die. And my mother, who is the most brilliant human being on the planet, understood. Um, she took me to a doctor and the doctor wanted to know what I thought was wrong with me. So I explained that I didn't think there was anything wrong with me. I didn't think I was necessarily going to die soon, um, but that eventually I was going to die. And this clearly, he didn't have any clue. He gave me some antidepressants and my mum took them off him, said thank you very much. We went home, she flushed them down the toilet. Um, we'll leave the ecological side of that to one side for the time being. And, um, and that experience basically shaped the entire of the rest of my life. It was responsible for the fact that I took theology rather than law at university. It was responsible for the fact that when I did get to do a master's degree, um, 
this wasn't deliberate. I didn't even realise until I looked back at the topics that I'd studied. I studied world religions at Lampeter, and it was only when I'd finished it and I looked back that I realised that my MA was about death. Um, I met a lovely lady while I was doing this who said, you are going to get involved with funerals and um, the death service. This is what you are going to do. Um, and I said, no, 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 no. Me here, death over there. Um, and then about three years later, I bumped into her again when she came up to Durham doing with a play that she was doing at the DDD conference in Durham. And I introduced her to my new partner having been divorced while I was doing my, my master's. And, um, and I said, this is my new partner, Keith, he's a funeral director. Mm -hmm. And she said, beg, beg your pardon, Jenny, he's a what? I said, funeral director. And uh, she very graciously didn't say, I told you so. But, um, but there we are. So that is kind of it. I, I, I have a complicated relationship with death. I've also had some interesting experiences at uh, Eleusis in Greece. I think I had a bit of a chat with death, but that's, um, like I said, buy me a drink sometime. Um, so my relationship with death, when I say that I feel that what I do is vocational, I mean that sort of vocational where you can run and hide if you like, but you're not going anywhere. Um, and so, you know, time and time again, both academically and professionally, I come back to this. And this is why, um, I, I feel that maybe I'm an appropriate person to be to be giving this talk around Samhain. Um, so I'm going to start a little bit by talking about what I have discovered about pagans and death. And you will understand, some of you being pagans, that everything I say from this point on is an enormous generalisation. Because, you know, you, you hear the thing that if you have two Christians or two Jews in the room, you have three different opinions. In my experience, if you have one pagan in a room, you have three different opinions. So <laughs> this is hugely, hugely generalized. Um, but what I did, one of the things I did as part of my research, which I feel has been hugely valuable, is I made a survey about um, afterlife beliefs, beliefs about death beliefs about funerals, beliefs about the disposal of bodies and memorialization. And I put it in some places where I know that there are pagans. Mostly they were on Druid Facebook groups because what I'm researching primarily is Druidry. But um, it was shared to a lot of other places as well. And um, it ended up in America. So I ended up, um, I remember saying to my, my partner when I was first doing this, I've read quite a lot of PhD theses at this point, and all of them that have a chapter on uh, methodology, and all of them that use a survey, have at least two paragraphs explaining why it is that even though only six people responded to their survey, it is still statistically valuable. Uh, so I didn't have high hopes of this, because this is just about every PhD I've read that uses a survey at all. So. My, my partner asked me, he said, how many responses do you need to make this useful? I said, 50 would be brilliant. I can do statistically useful stuff with 50 responses. 100 would be marvellous. Well, it turns out that pagans really like to talk about themselves, which is, from my point of view, is fantastic. So what I am currently sitting on is 1,038 responses which I think is the biggest resource in existence in the world about paganism and death. And um, I think it is also going to be a very valuable mine for further research when I finally, because this has been six years now, when I finally finish my PhD. Um, and so there were some very interesting questions in there. I would do some things differently now. I would phrase some questions so that I could at least partially get percentile answers more easily. Um, but I got absolutely brilliant information and the sheer generosity of people in their time and in their openness in answering the survey absolutely took my breath away. It was just amazing. So what did I discover? Um, I discovered, no huge surprises, that there are a large number of different afterlife beliefs within paganism. 
I think I went in expecting to find that most pagans believed in reincarnation. Um, now, I haven't actually finished the number crunching on this yet, but it's coming out a lot more even than I expected. And as you would expect, most people have complex beliefs. That's no surprise. It's no different in any other tradition, I suspect. A huge number of people do believe in reincarnation. A huge number of people also spoke in terms of... Um, some sort of other world. Um, a lot of people were using the phrase summer lands. A lot of people were using the phrase other world. And other people were talking about it in some other way. Some people were talking about an ancestral realm. Um, but some sort of space in which they envisaged a continued existence that was more or less embodied. And that doesn't necessarily mean embodied in the way that we are now, but embodied in the sense of having some sense of intact personality and some form of physicality and physical agency. Um, what was a very common belief was that was these sort of two beliefs combined. There seemed to be an awful lot of people who were saying that there was some sort of period of rest or some sort of period of learning, or some sort of period of interim. Some even actually used the word bardo, which is a Tibetan Buddhist word, to describe this sort of interim period somewhere else, and then that people were reincarnated. Other people were talking in terms of a purely spiritual existence uh, following death, and in some times that this would continue indefinitely, and sometimes that this would be prior again to reincarnation. And sometimes people were talking in terms of elective reincarnation. So in other words, people were choosing to be re reincarnated because they believed that they had something to do or something to learn. Um, a lot of people didn't really unpack their ideas of reincarnation. So it's not clear to me how many or what proportion of the people who said they believed in reincarnation believe that this will go on pretty much indefinitely and what proportion of people believe that there is some sort of an end point and the end point where people did mention one was something along the lines of merging with the universe and this idea of merging with the universe was another one that was a very common one that a lot of people talked about um, a lot of people also talked in terms of balance between the body and the soul and I suppose a sort of cosmic recycling process where the body was recycled and went back into the, the land and um, became part of the universe again. And for a lot of people, they were talking about the soul in the same terms, that the life energy, however they expressed that, was something that was reabsorbed and came back into the the entirety of the cosmos and the extent to which individual personality remained intact in that varied between people. There was also um, quite a lot of people who just didn't know, which is an entirely valid response to that question. I think anybody who is claiming to have any great deep knowledge of, of what happens in detail is, is probably setting themselves up for a fall. Um, there were a lot that believe that nothing happened, that death is the end of consciousness and that it's the end of individual personality. And this is interesting to me because these people are active pagans. So, um, how that relates into ideas about the divine and ideas about spirituality is something that I explore when I'm unpacking and talking about this. Um, there were a lot that came into the general category of other and amongst these others there were a lot of people or there were people who were talking in terms of what happens to you is what you expect to happen to you, a very sort of Terry Pratchett way of exploring things. Um, and so if you are a heathen, then it's quite clearly laid out what happens to you on death. Whereas uh, a druid might be looking towards Tiananmen or the Summerlands. 
uh, a heathen might be looking towards um, hell or um, the halls of one of the gods. Um, and a lot of them said, and Christians go to heaven or hell. So the whole thing is, you know, it, it is dependent on what you think is going to happen. Um, some talked about reuniting with a higher self so that there is a real you that transcends time and space. And if there are reincarnations, each of these is to some extent an aspect of that complete higher self that you merge with eventually. And that's an idea that I find very interesting indeed. Um, and some, and there were a number of Kemetic pagans speaking in these particular terms, said, well, you know, Christianity typically speaks of a body and a soul. But actually, I don't think that. I think you're made up of a lot of parts. And this, of course, is something you find in Buddhism with the skandhas, where there are five elements that make up a person. And in a lot of cultures, ancient Egyptian culture spoke of a number of souls, as does Chinese culture. So they said there are different parts and each part has a different destination after life. So the summary to that really is that there, are a, there is a huge, rich and various tradition within paganism of different ideas about what happens when you die. What seems to um, unite an awful lot, not all, but an awful lot of these people is how that is then um, reflected and how pagan values are then reflected when it comes to looking at funerals. Um, so far and away, one of the questions was, what form would you like your funeral to take? And this is one of the times when I was a little bit simplistic in the options that I gave people. And also, um, this does still need a little bit of number crunching done on it, because some people answered other, and then went on to describe one of the options that had actually been given. So I do need to do a little bit more analysis on this to get the percentage numbers a little bit better. Um, I was expecting a runaway verdict in terms of natural burial. I was expecting natural burial possibly to be up in the 80%. And to my surprise, it actually wasn't. Um, the majority of people, well, there was a huge range. So 3.5% um, wanted to be buried in a local cemetery. Now that's quite low and that didn't surprise me particularly. Um, woodland burial was the highest single choice at 34%. So woodland burial or natural burial, for those of you that don't know what that is, um, there are a number of sites, I think there's about 250, it could be more than that now, sites around the country where um, people are buried in woodland or meadowland. Uh, they're buried with nothing that isn't biodegradable, there's no form of embalming, and usually there's no formal marking of the grave either. Um, and so it's very natural, it leaves no obvious mark. Um, and 34% wanted to do that. A surprisingly similar number, 29.5%, so nearly 30%, wanted to be cremated. And if you add to that a further 12.2% in addition to that, who were looking for open air cremation. Now, this is a complex issue, and legally it's very complex in the UK. At the moment, I would say it is technically legal, but functionally illegal in the UK. But there was still a fair minority that would, would like that option. And there were a few that actually said, I haven't chosen this because it's not legal. But if it was legal, this is what I would want to happen. So open air cremation is pretty much what it says on its tin, a wooden pyre. Um, it would be in an enclosed area so people couldn't just wander into it and the body would be cremated probably over a number of hours where people could actually physically be present and see what was happening. 15.3% um, wanted other, and amongst the others, there were a number of options. So some were talking about resumation, 
which is sometimes called water cremation, which is a process of dissolving the body in an alkali solution. Um, and it has, apparently compared with cremation, it has a very small eco footprint. One or two were talking about cremation. Now this was mooted, I can remember this being talked about five or six years ago. And the idea is to freeze the body with liquid nitrogen and then basically vibrate it down into a dust. And a lot of people liked this idea. Unfortunately, as far as I am aware, nobody has yet demonstrated that it can be done. Um, so it's one of those lovely ideas that has yet to be um, actually worked out. Uh, quite a number were talking about sky burial or excarnation or some other method by which the body could literally, you know, without even being buried, go back, be eaten by animals, be consumed by nature. Um, interestingly, uh, one person talked about being cremated on a boat. Um, a number of people talked about their cremated remains being put into a, um, a pot with a tree, with a tree sapling. There are some companies doing this, and this, this really upsets me quite a bit because they don't work. That, that amount of cremated remains would kill a tree stone dead in no time. So if that's what you want to do, you are far better putting a handful around several trees and doing it that way. But that, that idea had got into people's heads. One that I found really interesting was um, one person wanted to donate their body to medical science, and there were quite a number that wanted to do that. That was quite a popular option but they wanted their skull to be defleshed and they wanted that to be available to be kept by their descendants, which was another idea that I found really interesting to see that. A couple, one person specifically talked about some sort of ceremonial building to go over their grave, which of course seems to be archeologically, this is how barrows first started. A lot of them were originally uh, a dwelling house with a burial beneath it and then the, the mound built on top of it. So from my point of view, with my interest in barrows, I found that very interesting as well. Now, in terms of um, what they would like the type of funeral to be like, who would they like to take it? Now, there was a much stronger preference here in that um, 50 3% I think of people said that their ideal would be to have the service taken by a pagan celebrant who they knew. Uh, and then an extra 5%, so it came to a 57% in total, said that they wanted the service to be taken by a pagan celebrant. Now that surprised me a bit because speaking as a funeral director, all the inquiries, all the pagans that I have dealt with in a capacity as a funeral director, and there are not many, it has to be said. Um, all of those wanted a civil celebrant, not specifically a pagan celebrant, because they felt that uh, that would be more comfortable for the other people attending the funeral. Um, so to see that, um, most people, seven, nearly 80% said they would know how to go about finding a pagan celebrant. They would know how to go about finding details about a pagan type ceremony and that I found very comforting um, that was that was really good for me to hear um, I'm going to come off statistics quite soon because I know statistics are a, a slow way of dying um, what did really surprise me is that only 20% of the people that answered were interested in having their body looked after at home now I thought of all the groups of people that would be interested in home funerals. Probably pagans would be quite high up on that list, but in fact they weren't. And um, that's something, and when we get onto questions and discussion, it might be quite interesting to explore why that might be the case. But most people did want a funeral director to take some control over the funeral or to take some responsibility, at least for the care of the body. Um, something else which I did just want to flash up here, 83% of the pagans who responded to me said that they had spoken to their family about what they wanted to happen. That's brilliant because again, pay, funeral director hat on, the worst thing you can have is a family that doesn't know what the person wanted. 
Um, however, that transfers into 18% who had actually put it into writing in some way or another. Um, so I think if I have a message for you tonight, it's if you know what you want to happen, write it down and give it to somebody. Um, really do that, have that conversation. Um, Eighty-two percent of people, and this is perhaps really interesting coming into Samhain, eighty-two percent of people said that ancestors, relations with ancestors, were connected in some way or another with their religious or magical practice. So almost everybody said that they do something to honour the ancestors, whether that's seasonal that happens at Samhain, whether it's praying for the dead, whether it's keeping uh, an altar to the ancestors, whether it is inviting ancestors into a circle when a circle is cast, 82% were doing something that, that um, maintained a connection to ancestors, however they understood ancestors. And of course, in, um, in paganism, there are a number of different ways of understanding what an ancestor is, some of which could be um, ancestors of blood, which is pretty much self-explanatory, ancestors of place, uh, which is anyone or anything that has lived in this, the place, the locality which you now occupy. Um, ancestors of tradition, which is people that have had a big impact on who you have become. Now for um, Wiccans that might include Joel Gardner, it might include Doreen Valiente, it might include any number of people who would be regarded as ancestors of tradition. Um, I would count people like Ross Nichols in my list of ancestors of tradition, but I would also include um, some of the anthropologists of religion, for example who have set up the methodologies that I use when I, I talk about what I'm doing. So people like uh, Mercia Eliard, although his methods may not be terribly current, if he hadn't done what he'd done, I wouldn't be where I am now. So this is the sort of thing I mean by ancestors of tradition. Um, but an awful lot of pagans are including those people in their day-to-day -day ritual and magical lives. Um, and when I asked, who is a funeral for? Um, is a funeral for the person that has died? Is that the main purpose of a funeral? Is it for their benefit? Is it for the benefit of the people that are left behind, the family or friends, which would be the, the standard modern position, I suppose, um, that basically the bereaved are the important people in a funeral. Um, and that was also reflected in the pagans, which again surprised me a little bit. 40% said that the funeral was for the bereaved. However, and only 2% said it was for the person that had died. However, that goes up to 58% who said that it's for both. So there was, and that I think is higher than I would have got if I'd asked outside a pagan group. So there's an awful lot of people who say, yes, the funeral is for the person that's died, but it's also for, uh, sorry, it's, all, it's for the, the people left behind the bereaved, but it's also uh, for the benefit of the person that's died. And that is something also that I find really interesting. Right, I'm going to move on because I'm aware that time is moving on. It always is. This is me when I'm talking. Um, Jen, so, Jennifer, do you want us to write the questions in the chat? so that you can read them and answer them or you can do i'm prepared I, i'm quite happy to do it either way if you want to write in the chat that is fine yes okay. um if you want to things crop up in your mind as you go along and it would be nice to just put it on the chat okay okay thanks i'll unmute myself again i'll mute myself i mean <laughs> <laughs> um so um spoken a little bit about natural burial, I've spoken a little bit about celebrants. Uh, there's a, a sheet um, that I've given to Julie that sort of goes along with this talk. It's really just headings, but it does at the bottom have some resources. Uh, and I do think this is quite important. Some of them are academic resources. So the books 
that I've worked with and I've tried to put um, the two that are specific to paganism, Journey into Spirit by Christopher Hughes, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with that, uh, but also the Pagan Book of Living and Dying by Star, Starhawk and um, Maka Nightmare, um, which also contains some funeral liturgy that is absolutely beautiful. So if you're looking for resources to look towards um, putting together a funeral, then that both of those books actually I would recommend very highly. Um, and I, I think that Julie is going to put this up with um, the link to or on the page for the uh, Centre for Pagan Studies. So it will be available. Um, there's also some books up there about something called continuing bonds. Um, I'll just mention I've also put there some resources. Um, so if you need more advice about doing funerals well in general, um, there's a link to the Good Funeral Guide. Um, we are members of the Good Funeral Guide. Louise Winter, who I know is also here, her funeral home also is. And it's basically about doing funerals differently and basically doing them better. And if you want advice on funerals, you could do a lot worse than go to their website. Uh, for natural burials, there's also the Natural Death Centre. Pagans specifically, uh, there is a fantastic website called Pagan Transitions, which brings together a lot of information on pagan liturgy, poems, rituals, where to find pagan celebrants. And that is a fantastic resource. And the link to it is, is in this, uh, this book that I've put together. So if I just talk a little bit about um, continuing bonds and how all this relates to my academic work. Um, so there have been over the years a number of different theories relating to um, how people mourn, how people experience grief. And prior to, so certainly in the 1960s, the prominent theory was connected with Sigmund Freud. And it basically said that the, the purpose of grief work was to separate yourself from the person that had died, to um, unhook, to disentangle them from you, which would then allow you to go forward and make new bonds. Um, this is not without some merit in some places, but in the 90s, there were some new scholars who came along and said, actually, that's not how people work. Um, how people actually work is that they don't stop having a relationship with somebody once they die. What they do is they change that relationship. Uh, and it, it, it modifies. Um, now, all of this is completely separate from a discussion of whether the person that has died continues to exist in a recognizable form or not. So whether you continue to be you after death, or whether there is nothing after death, or whether you continue but you're personality does not stay intact in the way that it is during life regardless of all that the person continues to have a relationship a bond with the person that has died and that changes and so um, people and this used to be pathologized in a way that was very unfortunate people continue to talk to their dead friends and relatives and this was treated as something that needed to be cured and in fact, what that is, is a perfectly normal human response. Um, and people go to graves to share news. They do these things. And these theories, this idea was um, started to come into common, um, into sort of the academic awareness of grief studies in the 1990s. Um, and it was an author called Class. Um, and the original book was Continuing Bonds, New Understandings of Grief. So this theory is continuing bonds and it says that these bonds continue. And when you come to consider paganism, 
of course, this idea of continuing bonds then starts to have new depths, it starts to have new layers. Because these bonds, and this is one of the things that I'm arguing for in my PhD, um, continuing bonds are usually understood to go forward. So this is how the relationship between you and your mother, your father, your partner who has died continues and may even continue to develop after that person has died. What I am arguing is that certainly in a pagan context, it also goes backwards. So for pagans, there are these continuing bonds with ancestors and that these are active and open relationships that continue to be developed. And pagans, certainly a lot of pagans, believe that they are developed on both sides and that the ancestral dead need and want to connect to the living just as the living need and want to connect to the ancestral dead. And this, of course, comes into ideas about, um, in my personal research, comes into ideas about landscape and deep time, the formation of landscape over deep time, um, whether that is through human agency or whether it predates human agency. So, I mean, Stonehenge would be a perfect example, I suppose, of, of what I'm talking about with deep time. So there is, um, you may know that there is a natural feature at Stonehenge that was there way before any human activity at all that points towards the, um, the sunrise and set around the solstice. And a lot of archeologists now believe that it is the existence of this natural feature that led that site to be chosen for everything that came afterwards. And um, so you there have a combination of natural agency and human agency that combine to form a landscape. And that landscape has continued to have changing and differing meaning to people from the people that built it up to today. Um, and, and this is what I'm talking about when I talk about people engaging in and building a relationship with the landscape. And the new barrows very much come into this way of thinking in terms of people, the people that I've interviewed that are connected with these barrows think very much in terms of wanting to become a part of a landscape and wanting to have a relationship with a, a landscape that is, has a connection to an imagined image of the past. And um, to call it wanting to be connected to tradition, I think is a little simplistic. There's, there's a lot more to it than that. There are a lot more layers going on than that. But there is certainly something very deep that has to do with relationship with landscape and relationship with a network of beings. Um, to use Graham Harvey's phrase, only so, uh, a network of persons, only some of which are human. Um, and so this could be relationship with the animals and um, Salton Manor is particularly good at this. There's, there's one of these barrows at Salton Manor. Um, and the way that this is integrated with the wildlife around it is fabulous. Um, but it might also, particularly for pagans, be connected with the idea of land whites or spirits um, or ancestors and relationship with ancestors. Now, of course, the original one of these barrows um, is built more or less within, this is the one at All Cannings, um, in, Wiltshire, and this is built within an existing uh, sacred landscape. So if there, there's a hill in the way, if there wasn't a hill in the way, you could see West Kennet Long Barrow from all cannons. And so it is actually part of an existing sacred landscape. I think it's the only one that is. And that again is part of a hugely important and a hugely interesting discourse. So what I am researching really is where, is where pagan beliefs, specifically Druid beliefs, come together with theories about landscape, come together with theories about um, the reuse of landscape, relationship with landscape over millennia. Um, what Richard Bradley talks about is commemoration or the creation of memory to do with landscape. It has to do with continuing bonds and networks of relationships with human and non-human persons and non-living persons as well. Uh, and it has to do with all of how all of this comes together in the way that pagans treat their dead, interact with their dead, and continue to have relationships with their dead. And I think I'm going to leave it there and um, 
if there are any questions or anything anybody wants to bring up i can see there is a question i'm just going to read it now um so how feasible do you feel it is to develop a spiritual or psychic relationship with someone on the other side who is not actually a blood relative or even someone you knew in life um i'm not going to comment on that because i i do not know i don't even know what i believe not only do i not know what everybody else believes i don't even know what i believe um it changes on an almost daily basis my my feeling from what i have spoken to pagans and what i try to do is to reflect pagans beliefs is that that is not an issue and if 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 the basis of this question is to do with ancestry then ancestry i don't think in any pagan tradition that i've come across is only solely and totally to do with um blood um there is no sense in which somebody has to be related to you by blood in order to be an ancestor or in order to be somebody who takes an active interest in you and your life and i actually i did an interview a few weeks ago for a group called ancestral eyes um who are connected with indigenous religion in canada um and the indigenous religions of nigeria and um, and africa and the relationship that that has to do with ancestry and they were very much convinced that um, people have ancestors or ancestral spirits that take great interest in them and that these may not be from your race or from any culture that you recognize at all this is not necessarily something that happens so um i wouldn't have said that that was an issue but i'm not speaking in, in terms of my personal beliefs here because i don't even know what they are <laughs> but, um, in terms of how um how pagans in my experience would react to that question I don't know if there's anyone any... else got a question there must be another question i was interested in this thing about um you said about personality mm. but it, personality is the spirit of the person isn't it really well it depends on the model that you're looking at okay. uh, the idea of the body as being the sort of dense physicality of a person mm. and the spirit being what makes that person into a person if you see what i mean mm. is a very western idea and it's something that has got deeply embedded in christianity and christianity being ancestral to the way that we think in western europe to the extent that it's actually quite difficult to think in any other way um but that is not the only model that exists not by any means so so, um, <laughs> so for example if you're going to look at, at, at real sort of animism there would not necessarily be the idea that there is a spiritual dimension to somebody at all there would be perhaps the idea that the body the physicality is the person but that um i suppose for some animists there's the idea of psychism which is the idea that um whatever the universe itself is made of uh, at its at its most basic level whether that be atoms or what atoms whatever atoms are made of and i i have asked many physicists and i have never yet come across anybody that could explain to me what energy is i can find lots of people that can explain to me what energy does in great detail but i have never yet found anybody that can explain in any way that makes sense to me what energy actually is so let's say that energy is the thing that makes up the universe whatever it is um psychism would be the belief that that basic foundational building block is conscious in some way or another so not that there is something coming from outside the universe that is separate to it that gives consciousness but that the universe is made up of conscious stuff and from that point of view when somebody dies there is the possibility that that consciousness and i've heard this described in terms of quantum entanglement continues or that the personality is absorbed back into um the whole and the way that some people describe this is to say that a, an individual personality an individual person is like a wave 
They never stop being part of the sea, but that wave has a limited existence. And when it's gone, it's gone, but the water in it goes back into the sea. It never stops being a part of the ocean. And to that extent, our consciousness is absorbed back into the whole, but it doesn't necessarily retain the, the shape and the function that makes it into a particular person. Does that make any sense at all? Yes, thank you very much, yes. I mean, different people believe different things, and this yes. is it, there are many, many different ways. And some people, I know quite a lot of Druids who um, believe that there are, is more than one aspect of the personality or the soul. And that uh, you, you very often, particularly in the British Druid order, you hear people talking about the three cauldrons. Yeah. And that these have different destinations so that there is the other world, but there is also reincarnation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and if you are going to, be, if you're going to have uh, practices that involve ancestors and you believe in reincarnation, there has to be some way of squaring that circle and say, well, if everybody is reborn in this world, who are you talking to when you're talking to the ancestors? And one way that people do this is by saying, well, different aspects of people do different things in different places. But there are many, many ways of, of explaining that. Thank you, Jennifer. A couple more questions. Um, Luce, Lucia Moreno, do you think that people who answered your questionnaire were more interested in death than the average pagan? Could that explain the 80% who had spoken to their family about their own funeral? It uh, is possible. Yes. Um, it was a big survey, wasn't it? It was a huge survey and it went into many, many different places. It is possible because obviously, um, I mean, there was right at the beginning, and this was something that I made very clear when I was doing my ethical application to my university to do this research because you're obviously talking about very sensitive stuff here. And before people, they had to click a button that would take them to the first question. And on the page where that button was that they had to click, there was a, a statement that said, this survey is about death. It will ask you about death. It will ask you about funerals. Um, I recommend that you don't answer it if you have lost somebody within the last year. Mm. Um, but, you know, be aware that these questions exist. You can stop answering at any point. You don't have to, there's no compulsory questions, you know, this sort of thing. So to get to the survey, people had to click on that. And that meant that they, they knew that they were going to be talking about death in quite a lot of detail. Yeah. So um, verified them a bit. In my experience, a lot of pagans are quite comfortable doing that. Um, having said that, yes, there is, there is the bias in there that people who had no interest in death but were pagans would probably not have gone to the survey. And those people probably haven't spoken to their family about their funerals. And they, those people possibly don't include their ancestors in their practice. So, yes, and the problem with this sort of survey is always that it's going to be self-selected. So what it does is it tells me about proportions of people that are pagan and interested in death. Yeah, thanks. So um, there's a second part to that question. How does psychism differ from pantheism? I don't think I've heard of psychism myself. Um, Panpsychism. It's... Oh. It's it's a it's a tricky one that I mean, um, can we you get into really it quite a lot of detail. Could you define it because I don't know what psychism. Okay, Panthe pantheism. Yes, yeah, so is kind of the belief that um, it means all God, literally, and it is kind of the belief that everything is God. There is nothing that is not God, um, which makes it quite close to monism. Are you trying to sort of separate these different theisms it gets horribly academic and complicated and only people like me are interested in it um so the universe is divine and there is nothing outside the universe to be divine is pantheism you then have panentheism which is a more occultist view which is that there is a divine that is outside the universe but it is reflected and becomes imminent within the universe. 
So this is where the idea of things like the doctrine of signatures comes from. Because what is divine, you know, as above, so below, what is divine is reflected into the natural world. That's, a, broadly speaking, that's a panentheistic view. Panpsychism literally means the, the universality of psyche, which was the word the Greeks used for something approximating to what we would call soul. Um, and it, it basically is, it, it's not using words like God or divine. It's basically saying that at the bottom, whatever, whatever the base material, the tiniest building blocks that everything is made out of, and we still don't really know what they are, whatever they are, on some level, they are conscious. So it's moving away from this dualism that says there is body on one side, there's physical matter here, and there is spiritual soul here. They're completely different things. And in some way, at some level, they connect. And that is dualism. And that has been the basis of Western philosophy. It comes from the philosopher Plato in Greece. And um, when, and materialism is basically a reaction against it. So materialist and reductionist science is saying that idea doesn't work, it's ridiculous. Um, and the whole of the Western scientific and philosophical debate has tended to go for those two sides. Either you're a dualist or you're a materialist. And what hasn't got a lot of, of space in the debate is this middle ground, which is the panpsychism, which says, no, there, there, there aren't two things. There is one thing. There's no dualism. There's no body here, soul here. But the one thing that there is, is conscious. So you don't have to explain how the physical matter brain produces consciousness, which nobody has yet managed to do. You don't have to explain that anymore because the consciousness is inherent in the brain. It's not coming from somewhere else and it's not coming from an external soul. So that really is panpsychism. I, I don't know if that helps to answer the question at all. Oh, so can you read the next one is um contemporary pagan funerary monuments do they exist are they legal um marco is an archaeologist and he's curious to know if archaeology inspired any sort of contemporary on a monumental mm. level um not that i'm aware of in this country okay. they certainly wouldn't be illegal uh, there's nothing particularly if it's on your own land there's nothing to stop you building um a pagan monument uh the closest i can get um to going back to barrows which are my thing you probably have gathered um two things to say about barrows one is that i know of at least one burial that was in a small burial mound on somebody's own land so they had constructed effectively a and this was burial it wasn't cremation they had constructed a burial mound for themselves um there is nothing illegal about that and that that person obviously was a pagan um and that i suppose you could describe in terms of um contemporary pagan monument monument mon death monument <laughs> um, now the other the other concerns all cannings again and this is a very interesting situation um, where all cannings both is and isn't a pagan public monument um, it was constructed as a no faith space if you like it was constructed, and this is something else that is really interesting about the barrows. Do not get me started about barrows um, and, and why different people like them, because Christians are, are on board with a lot of these pagans. We've got Hong Kong Buddhists in, in one of them. They, they're appealing to such. Well, this is read my PhD. You'll like it um, if I ever finish it. Um, but. 
it was not meant to be a faith space. It was meant to be available for all religions and none. And there are people who have spaces there who came to it because they did not want it to be associated with a particular faith or religion. They needed a space. And this, again, is hugely important in my way of thinking. They needed a space that was not religious or spiritual, but was connected to the possibility of ritual and ground up ritual, by which I mean that it came the people whose, whose dead were there created the ritual. There was no pre-existent ritual that was imposed on them. And that seems to be one of the things that people find so powerful about the Barrows. And that, I think, and speaking with funeral director hat on, what is really missing, I feel, from non-religious funerals, religious with a big R, connected to a particular bounded religion, what is missing from non-religious funerals is ritual. The liturgy is fine. You can have people saying great things. But what you don't get at non-religious funerals very often is ritual and that is what is really missing and that is what we need to find a way of bringing in um, and um, in the barrows this was very much the case however the gentleman who was responsible for all cannings the farmer on whose land it was built um, found himself facing a tax bill for a very considerable amount of money from the very kind government uh, because they had decided that because his barrow was not a place of, uh, it wasn't a designated religious site, and what it therefore was, was commercial storage. And on the grounds that it was commercial storage, he was given a, um, a bill based on the square footage of the barrow. Now, as you can imagine, pretty much everybody was annoyed about this. Um, and the way that he got around it, or the way that he tackled this, was to have the barrow registered officially as a religious site. And he had it registered as a Druidic religious site. Um, there were Druids, there are Druids that meet there. There are Druids who have niches there. It had, there have been Druid rituals going on there since it was, since it was built but it was never intended to be a site for druids there are many many other people there as well but it had to be registered as a druidic place of worship in order to not get this tax bill for it to be a place of commercial storage the argument is still ongoing um i'm not sure i need to get back to him actually and talk about this and find out what the current situation is um i think most people there including those who wanted it to be a non-religious space understood the reason for it and were therefore okay with it so technically, All Cannings is a pagan um, funerary monument, but at the same time, it isn't. Um, what you do get, of course, is um, a lot of pagans who want cremated remains scattered in or around existing ancient monuments. Yeah. And that is a whole different discussion. So uh, I know of people who have done this. You're not technically supposed to, of course. Um, the one archaeologist I've spoken to about it says he doesn't honestly think it makes a huge amount of difference in terms of contamination of the site because modern cremated remains look very, very different to ancient cremated remains and it's very difficult to confuse them. Um, I have a photograph that was sent to me um, of a, uh, a kissed burial uh, or a kissed grave with a pile of what is very clearly human cremated remains in it. And this is, you know, modern human cremated remains. And this is, you know, that there is very much this feeling that people want to be close to these ancient sites. Yeah. And a lot of people in confidence have told me that this is their intention to do this. Um, and, and interestingly, there, um, when um, Stonehenge was being excavated in the 1950s, they did find a Victorian age jar containing cremated, human cremated remains which is almost certainly connected with the universal bond which we're using the place for worship at the time so um yeah that's that's a whole different conversation around around that but obviously parents do do that and they do want to do that great next question from tj let me see if i can voice what i'm thinking for pagans who believed in reincarnation was there a level reach similar to Buddhism where they became an ancestor? I haven't heard that specifically. I haven't heard that the 
the... By the way, TJ, you can unmute and you can ask your own question if you want. <laughs> TJ, where's TJ? I am here. Oh, great. You can... Hello. Hello. <laughs> Let's talk about this then. <laughs> um, I haven't heard any pagan talk about it in terms of the end point of reincarnation being becoming an ancestor which isn't to say that there aren't pagans that think like that, but none that I have actually come across. Um, some pagans um, talk about reincarnation as being something that carries on pretty much forever as long as the earth exists because they don't see uh, a soteriological aim to reincarnation. So there is, there is nothing to be saved from or enlightened into, if that makes sense, because the physical world is inherently good. Um, so there's no need to move on to another level. That's one view that's quite common in paganism. Another view is that reincarnation continues until you have learned all that you need to learn. And then people start to talk in terms of merging with the universe in some sense. So this would be very much, I suppose, like the Hindu idea of moksha. Um, mm. where, and, and monist ideas where the illusion that there is a difference between you and everything else disappears and you become it's not that you become one with everything it's that you realize you always have been one with everything mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. the other thing that people sometimes talk in terms of is um i think i mentioned briefly earlier on the idea that there is a higher self mm -hmm. that exists across all of space and time so um, whereas um, from the perspective of being on earth, you might experience reincarnation as being a series of incarnations over time. If you could see it from the right perspective, they would actually all be happening at the same time because there is no time or there is no chronological time. And therefore all of these incarnated selves are aspects of the, the one true self. That, that you you realize um, the idea of ancestors um, that I have come across the idea which you find in quite a lot of indigenous religions that a person becomes an ancestor after a period of about a year so there are quite a lot of indigenous cultures that have a ceremony after about a year at which a person ceases to be experienced in terms of um, a brother or a wife or a father and starts to be experienced in terms of an ancestor um, or part of a homogenous group of ancestors and there is usually some sort of ritualization of this. Uh, I haven't come across a lot of this as a ritual within contemporary paganism which surprised me a little bit. Uh, but I haven't come across this very often. Um, so there is this idea that there is a period of time. There's also the idea that the more time goes on and the less immediately connected a dead person is to the living, the more sort of homogenized they become, the more they become a part of the, you know, the unknown dead. Um, and people relate to those obviously differently the way to the, to the way they relate to their own known dead. Um, yeah. So yeah, the whole issue of ancestry and, and how you become an ancestor is a fascinating one, but I haven't come across it in specifically those terms, no. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the next question from Alison. I haven't seen your survey and I have spoken to my family about my death, how I want my funeral and where I want my ashes scattered but I um, admit I haven't written it down, so we need some practical advice on this, really. It's important, isn't it? It is important. Um, what I can say here is I think my, uh, my contact details are going to be up on this. Um, is it my academic email that you've got, Julie? I think it is. Um, one of the things my funeral home does is that it has a document that you can fill in, um, in as much or as little detail as you would like, that basically documents what you would like to happen. Um, what you would like to happen to your body after you die, who you would like to be involved, 
um, what sort of funeral service you would like to have. Obviously, and it, it needs to be said at this point, this has no legal status in the UK whatsoever. This is one of the little foibles of UK law. Mm -hmm. um, the wishes of the dead have no legal force. Uh, that's not the case in every country, but it is in the UK. They, there was a consultation a little while ago. I mean, and I think you're aware that there's new uh, draft legislation around weddings and um, partnerships. Um, the government was consulting a couple of years ago about uh, death, and I was asked to speak to them on behalf of a number of pagan organisations. But that seems to have disappeared, I suspect, because they have a few other things on their mind. I think just as they were doing this consultation, um, Brexit ramped up into um, full gear and they lost interest in everything else. Um, but so this has no legal force. But if anybody would like to send me an email, I can email you a copy of this form if you would like to. And you can then fill that out, keep it either digitally or print it out, put it with your will, put it with your personal papers, and then people know what it is that you would like to do. So th that's one place I can give you some actual practical help. Yeah. Thank you. Jackie Clapperton, with regard to ritual ceremonial outside of religion, the military funeral is one example. Yes. The ceremonial is laid down and remains the same regardless of any religious input. Having been to several, including that of a close friend, the ceremonial brings comfort as well as a sense of connection to all those who've gone that way before. Hmm. Yeah, Did this, that makes sense. It does, yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. The military is also very good at ceremony and ritual. Yes. Um, they are. I they like are. it. Um, this, this, this is what I feel is missing from civil celebrants and humanists. Not all of them, of course, um, but from a lot of them, there, there is not this engagement in um, ceremony and ritual and actually one of the questions that I asked was people that had recently attended a funeral which mm -hmm. they saw to be specifically pagan um, what was it about that that pagan funeral that worked better than other funerals that they'd been to or didn't work better than other funerals they'd been to um, the things people didn't like usually had to do with Christians there that insisted on saying a prayer or insisted on getting involved or insisted on some Christian element. Mm. Uh, that was quite common. Um, what people commented on a lot that they liked, firstly was the lack of the, I suppose, the heaviness. There was, there was no expectation that it had to be maudlin, I'm going to say. I think that's the word I'm going to use. Funerals are sad. If it's not sad, you're not doing it right. Um, and when people talk about a celebration of life, I think they're using the wrong meaning of the word celebration sometimes. Yeah. Um, to celebrate is to honour, it's to observe um, as you celebrate a festival. And yes, there can be elements of joy. Of course, you can laugh at a funeral. At a good funeral, you will laugh and you will cry. Um, but maudlin, which is just miserable for the sake of being miserable, or heavily bound to, to tradition or forms of what ought to be done. Mm -hmm. A lot of pagans felt that the pagan fe um, funeral they'd been to freed them from that. There wasn't that expectation. Um, and the other thing that people talked about a lot was actually physically doing something. So there wasn't a person at the front talking to them. And of course, being pagans, a lot of this happened in circles rather than with one person standing at the front. And that changing that uh, space changing that physical space changes the dynamic as well very much but people talked about um, doing something they talked about drumming they talked about dancing they talked about anointing the actually the, the physical presence of the body which was another thing where it was possible which wasn't always the case uh, anointing the body with incense with oils with with, with things mm -hmm. like that with uh, people talking themselves saying things with calling the quarters, even something as simple as calling the quarters, mm -hmm. which means that it is not one person at the front who is responsible for feeding the ceremony to people. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and this is where I feel that paganism has something to teach the wider world. Even mm -hmm. those that have no pagan belief or have no belief at all 
to have this sort of ritual involvement, and I think involvement is the key word here, I think is an amazingly um, powerful mm -hmm. thing. And, mm -hmm. and, and that's a conversation that I want my, my thesis to open up. Thank you. But interesting. Um, in your survey, when you did your survey, did, did, uh, was there a, a discussion about suicide? Did you ask mm. us about people's... I didn't specifically suicide? ask about suicide, no. Oh. Um, I think I felt that was a little, uh, a little close to, you know, what I, I was comfortable asking people to do. Mm. Uh, I don't think any of the respondents specifically talked about suicide either. Mm. Um, because what I will say is that one funeral that I have been involved in that was, I would say, close to being pagan, where the person had taken their own life. Um, and that, that, that is a phraseology that I prefer because suicide tends to be connected, you know, there's the phrase to commit suicide and you commit a crime. So it's almost, you know, almost subversive in your mind that suicide is a wrong thing and it's a crime. Um, of course, legally it's not a crime, but also there was an acknowledgement at this funeral that the person had a right to do what they did. Um, that it was terribly sad. And then of course there is always the conversation because mental, mental unwellness is going to be a factor a lot of the time, not always with, with, um, with people that take their own lives. Um, and there is the conversation about, well, you know, how do you help somebody to know that it will get better? But, you know, there, there is also the fact, and there is, you know, medically motivated um, suicide. So, you know, for, for, for not everybody is it going to get better. Uh, and I think that there tends to be, certainly in the pagans, with the pagans I've had these conversations with, there does tend to be more of an acceptance that people have a right to have a degree of control and that that control might on occasion involve taking their own life and that that is something which under those circumstances is actually worthy of honour and respect rather than you know talking in hushed voices and not talking about it um, or you know implying that it's a, a wrong thing to do which is again an idea that comes out of I think um, a Christian background way of thinking which you know, implies that your life is not your own. Um, now, it's a very complicated issue, of course, because um, you are not entirely your own. Nobody exists outside of relationship. So whilst I would argue that my life is my own, and yes, I have a right to take it if I choose, I would also argue that my life, to some extent, also belongs to my parents and to my partner, um, and that if I choose to take it, it has consequences on them that I might not, I might not have a right to make. Um, but that's not the same as, as the debate, as the, the, uh, the conversation which tends to dominate actually legal discussions about suicide, which is my life is God's. And that's a very different thing to saying that my life belongs partially to my family and my friends. Um, it's a very, very complicated conversation, but the short answer is no, I didn't specifically address that in the survey. Perhaps I should have done. Uh, any, any other questions? Have I uh, done all the ones that were in the chat? I think I have. <laughs> no other questions? You can unmute yourself and ask a question if you want to. No. Don't generally bite. <laughs> Come on. No, I don't think I think we've all oh someone put their hand up. I missed it. Gabriella, go on. Hi there. <laughs> hi, hi Jennifer. Um oh. just would like to say thank you so very much for an incredibly deep and um the perspective of people's voices through your work has been absolutely brilliant absolutely brilliant so thank you for your work and it might be um a crunch question but um hope not too painful but when do you envisage perhaps your phd might be done <laughs> oh the one thing you never ask a PhD. Oh, no. 
Um, I'm writing up. I am actually in the process of writing up. Things keep getting in the way. Um, I am very much hoping that the final draft will have been submitted by the end of March. Oh, congratulations. So um, hopefully it will be. And my feeling is very much, I mean, I'm publicly funded, and that in itself is quite an amazing thing, public funding to do a PhD about paganism. Mm -hmm. um, this is continuing the work that Professor Hutton started. If it hadn't been for Triumph of the Moon, I would not be here. Um, but my feeling is very much that, I mean, I am a pagan, I'm a druid, um, and I feel very much that this thesis is an act of service to my community, amongst other things. Mm. And that, um, and following in particular the huge generosity of spirit of the people that have done interviews with me or have answered my surveys, um, this will be feeding back. Mm. Um, how remains to be seen. I am hoping to publish this as a book, but that may take me a while. Um, but you know, and it will be open access. So, you know, I, there will be ways of accessing the work and, and seeing what I've found and what I've written. And, and that for me is absolutely a matter of honor because this belongs to the pagan community as well as it belongs to me. Um, That's just a thank beautiful, you. beautiful heart, thank you.